Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. How do you protect human rights in a conflict zone? That's been the preoccupation, preoccupation of our next two guests for much of the past two decades. Both have worked at Human Rights Watch, possibly the world's most respected international human rights non-governmental body. There's Stacey Sullivan, currently Director of Communications with HRW. Hello Stacey, where are you talking to us from? Stacey's going to need your microphone on um, because I think you're muted because you've got children there in the background, but go ahead, Stacey. I'm on Long Island in New York right now. Oh, luck, lucky you. The weather's probably better there than it is here at the moment. And then we've also got Peter Buchart, who's formerly the Emergencies Director from HRW as well. Hello, Peter. Hello, and I'm joining you from France. Uh, whereabouts in France are you, Peter? I can see vines and sort of nice weather as well. Yes, it's Burgundy luckily. Burgundy, very nice, very nice. Well, it's going to be a great discussion. Um, I think many of you know about HRW, but I don't really think you know how they work. So I want to get some explanation of how that organization works, but also how human rights workers work. And also want to probe a little, what gives them the right to do this work? What is the legal basis for it? And who benefits? I should also add that and disclose that I worked briefly for HRW back in 2008 and covered the West Bank and Gaza during that time, but I hope it won't prevent me from asking some tough questions. So let's start with you, Peter. Um, you're in a conflict zone or a war zone. What are your objectives and how do you actually do your job, Peter? Yes. Um, the human rights movement didn't really start by working on conflict zones. Um, it really came more out of the former Soviet Union um, and an interest in protecting freedom of speech, um, freedom of expression, um, and political freedoms in repressive societies. And it's only really in the 1990s uh, with the Balkan Wars and the conflict um, in Rwanda um, that the human rights movement started thinking about how to document war crimes and crimes against humanity um, in a systematic way. And obviously documenting political freedoms in Eastern Europe meant working under surveillance, uh, meeting uh, with dissidents um, and others um, in secret. Um, going into a conflict zone is a very different kind of work um, requiring different skills. Uh, first of all, we have to be on the ground. Uh, we go into these conflicts when everybody else is fleeing. Um, and then we have to have access to the witnesses who've seen these incidents um, and the evidence on the ground um, to document exactly what's happening. Uh, because our objective is to get to the bottom of these things, to really establish the truth. Um, let me give you an example. I covered the war in Lebanon in 2006 between Israel and Hezbollah. Um, when the war started, I flew into Jordan and we had to cross all the way through Syria um, after negotiating and um, giving a little present to the border guards um, to get into Syria. Um, and then we had to drive into Beirut while Israeli airplanes were flying overhead, um, trucks were burning, burning um, targets were being attacked. Um, and then we started investigating who exactly was dying um, in these airstrikes. Um, Israel was saying that they were attacking Hezbollah um, rockets, um, um, storage spaces. Um, and so we went to all of these villages um, and we interviewed the people um, who had been around Israeli airstrikes. And what we discovered is that Israel actually was working on a mistaken um, assumption. They had assumed that Hezbollah had placed most of their uh, rocket um, storage facilities inside these towns and they were bombing targets inside the towns. When in fact, um, the rocket storage facilities and launching sites were outside the villages hidden in the olive groves and um, other rural infrastructure. Um, and, you know, you can say, how do you know if people are actually telling you the truth? We went through dozens and dozens of graveyards to actually see how people were buried. Uh, because if somebody belongs to Hezbollah and is a fighter, um, they will be buried as a martyr. Um, they will not be buried as a civilian. Um, so we went to document over a thousand deaths in Lebanon and we were able to establish and we took that evidence back to Washington okay. and to Tel Aviv, 
um, that they were hitting the wrong targets. Okay, so that that's, I mean, it's a tremendously sort of courageous job. And in a way, it sounds almost, it sounds like reporting in a way like a journalist. But the, I think the, the difference here, and you know, what the one has to understand is, what standard are you holding the military up against? I mean, what on what basis are you saying they're doing something wrong? Okay, so they've killed some civilians, um, but who says that's wrong? And how can you hold that government to account or that army to account? You know, I think it's very important to distinguish our work from the work of journalists. Um, journalists report stories. Um, they, they quote people um, saying things and denying things. We are investigators. We're actually investigating what happened in these situations and collecting evidence. Because on the basis of the evidence that we collect, uh, people can be indicted. Um, countries can decide to go to war um, to stop uh, genocide or other crimes against humanity. So a lot of um, responsibility weighs on our shoulders. Um, we, we are actually checking if people are telling us the truth. Uh, we're yeah. interviewing multiple, multiple um, witnesses to various incidents. Um, so it, we it's just to report, just interrupt you that it's international humanitarian law, and that's basically a, 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 a development from both the, the Hague and the Geneva Conventions. So those, those laws have been developed more recently. And that when you're looking at particular incidents, you're actually holding that as a standard to see whether they've actually broken those laws. Absolutely. I'm a Stanford-trained lawyer. Um, and I investigate these issues as legal issues, as crimes. Uh, we're investigating international crimes. And before we're going to accuse anybody of a crime, uh, we want to make sure we have our facts right. We also use technology, um, satellite imagery. To I use satellite imagery in Lebanon and in the Central African Republic to monitor the extent of the damage. We documented over 100 villages burned um, in the Central African Republic during the war. We also use, we monitor the social media accounts of various rebel groups in Syria to see what kind of weapons they're using. Um, they often proudly display the war crimes that they commit. Um, and then we have to uh, verify those videos, establish exactly where they were um, 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 recorded. Um, you know, you, it is possible to get to the truth. Um, it takes a lot of investigative work, but that's what we're after is getting to the bottom okay. of the matter. Thanks, Peter. I think that was a great introduction there. Let's, let's come back to you now, Stacey. So uh, you're armed with this information, Stacey. What do you do with it? I just wanted to, to um, back up for a second to say that in addition to um, what, what Peter mentioned, I remember in Lebanon in 2006, we also had a weapons expert on the ground. So I, I, he had, was someone that Human Rights Watch had hired from the Pentagon, and he could actually go and look at fragments of bombs that fell in Lebanon and see if they were smart bombs or dumb bombs, if they, if they were laser guided, if they had any kind of GPS system on them. And that was just a, a kind of expertise that a human rights investigator brought that a, a journalist wouldn't necessarily have. So once we're armed, back to your question, once we're armed with the information, I mean, with something, uh, with something like that, um, we first of all try to brief journalists who are covering the conflict on the ground. Um, and we are, you know, a lot of us are former journalists, so we have great contacts. We, it's a, a fairly small press corps that covers these kind of conflicts, so we know them well. Um, I think we're pretty trusted by them. So we would first of all brief the media and try to get the story out in the immediate term in a conflict uh, situation. Um, and more long term, we would be um, cultivating contacts with the press to be able to tell them the larger story over time. Um, and I would say that uh, we would use the information both for advocacy and in some cases, um, we've had some of our investigators, including I think Peter, you've probably testified, but some of them have testified at international war crimes tribunals and presented the evidence that we've collected. Yeah, okay, can, can you give us some, uh, uh, some concrete examples, some um, perhaps not about, I'll come to you, um, Peter, in a second to ask the same question, but Stacey, just give me some examples of where you think you've had you know, significant impact. Um, well, 
going all the way back to the 1990s when I think Nick, you were there too, when we were all covering the Balkans, um, Human Rights Watch issued really groundbreaking reports documenting ethnic cleansing and genocide on the ground. I mean, numerous reports. And um, our researchers then testified at the War Crimes Tribunal for Slobodan Milosevic, the Serbian leader, and for several paramilitary leaders um, in Bosnia and saw convictions actually as a result. So that's a pretty concrete example from us investigating and covering the crimes, publicizing them, testifying in a war crimes tribunal, and then getting some kind of accountability in the end. Yeah. Okay, well, th um, thank you for that. Um, everyone, the, do start putting questions in the Q&A box. Um, um, both Peter and Stacey can answer a whole range of questions. Um, Peter has covered a huge number of um, conflicts from um, Sri Lanka, um, I think Libya as well, a lot in the Middle East. Um, so there's a huge number of things that he's got some first-hand experience of. Um, Peter, I want to come back to you. Um, first of all, I'd love to hear how, um, what happened in 2006. So did the Israelis change what they were doing as a result, just as a concrete example? So I'll ask that question first, and then I want to come back to the, this question of law and do you have the right to be doing what you're doing? So Peter, just talk about Lebanon to start with and how that changed things. Well, just to add to what Stacy was saying, um, I mean, I think overall, um, looking back over the last um, two decades, even three decades, the biggest accomplishment of the human rights movement is that these issues are now framed in law. Um, you know, that's the kind of um, discussion that takes place when these incidents exist. Nobody is really denying um, that there is a legal framework um, that should govern what happens in war zones. Um, and those who do deny it often end up um, at the International Criminal Court. Um, that is coming a little bit under challenge these days. Um, I think with the rise, the rise of all of these right-wing authoritarian leaders, um, but it has become a very mainstream issue um, to see conflicts in terms of legal obligations. Um, in terms of Lebanon, yes, we did succeed um, to convince the Israelis that what they were doing wasn't working not only directly through our evidence, uh, but also through the pressure that came upon them um, from the US administration and from the Europeans um, saying, you need to stop this. Um, and in the middle of the war, they basically switched tactics. Um, they stopped the aerial bombing and switched um, to a ground offensive, which didn't go very far. Um, and then ultimately they decided they could just not reach their objectives. Uh, without causing massive civilian casualties um, and paying a heavy international price uh, with the international community turning against them. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to work in these very, very um, divisive conflicts where people have very strong opinions, they constantly accuse you of bias, um, but it is important to kind of cut through the fog of war um, and tell the story of what's really happening on the ground. And because we are so meticulous with our work, uh, people listen to us. I mean, even the Israelis, I flew straight from Lebanon to Tel Aviv, um, and we had a meeting with the chief of staff of the IDF and just about the entire senior military leadership to present our findings. Um, obviously, they disagreed with some of them, uh, but they took them very seriously. So the criticism is this, and I think that's a good example, is that the, the laws of war the, the basic premise was that this, um, the laws of war should be based upon military necessity. So an army or a country shouldn't go um, beyond what is military uh, necessary and in doing so harm the, the um, civilian population. But the shift has changed and so that um, the, the, the focus is now on, on civilians and that's taken the primacy away from um, armies and nation states. And so certainly, I think, I think there have been many governments who have been critical um, of, of this shift. And so therefore, you could argue, for example, in, in Israel, um, they wouldn't have lost so many men on the ground if they'd been allowed to continue uh, that strategy of air bombardment, Peter. Look, uh, we should remember that the framework of the laws of war came out of World War II. Um, a conflict that caused millions of deaths um, that led to a genocide against the Jewish people. Um, my father was a refugee in that conflict. 
Uh, my grandfather was on the battlefield of Flanders as a medic treating the first victims of the world's first chemical weapons attacks. Um, there is a reason why we have this framework in place and why it needs to be observed. Um, and our role in ensuring the, that the framework of IHL, of international humanitarian law, is observed is fundamental in importance. Uh, because the war crimes investigators from the International Criminal Court arrive only after we've done our work. They almost never enter an active conflict zone and they rely on our information. I mean, we were together in Lubaton um, in Macedonia in 2001. Um, I was witness number one against the interior minister of Macedonia for the massacre that we both witnessed there together. Uh, we, we, our investigations are respected and I don't think that this, the system um, protecting, uh, promoting the laws of war could work without the roles of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and the International Committee of the Red Cross, which does the same kind of investigations in a more confidential manner. And the, the uh, massacre or the, the killings that um, Pete is referring to is in a village in northern Macedonia, um, which the um, Macedonian um, military um, forces, police forces, uh, moved in and um, uh, killed, a, a, um, uh, I think, about um, nine people um, in one afternoon. Um, for which the interior minister was found not guilty um, at that after that trial. Um, Stacey, the, the US has got a reputation for backing um, these standards, backing these investigations, so we can talk about the, the Balkans, for example, and the War Crimes Tribunal, yet it doesn't like to apply the same standards to itself. Is that fair? Yeah, <laughs> I would say that's fair. The US was in favor of, you know, the US was one of the primary driving forces behind establishing the UN War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And likewise, the US was very much in favor of it for Rwanda. Um, and depending on which administration is in charge of the country, it's had varying degrees of, or, or is in power in the country, it's had varying degrees of, of support for the, for the International Criminal Court. But you know, right now we have an administration that is very hostile towards it, and we've never had, um, it's never been a very popular issue in the United States. Um, the United States, you know, like many countries, views itself as, as righteous and exceptional and doesn't want to abide by, by international treaties. So it's, um, it's a difficult system. It's, it's for, the, for the US, you know, we're, we're very supportive of it as long as it doesn't apply to us. Yeah, so you can understand in a way while um, these standards are seen as lopsided standards. If, you know, if you're a um, you know, country in a developing world that's been accused of X, Y, and Z crimes, and you say, well, it's, you know, the US doesn't apply these same standards to itself, so why the hell should we be held to the same account? A completely fair question. A completely fair argument. Um, I don't think any of us who are involved in the human rights movement um, would ever attempt to rationalize the U.S. position. Um, and it's a uh, an unfortunate reality of you know real politic in the world. Nonetheless, I think we have been able to um, make a difference in people's lives and upholding human rights, even in the United States and within international systems, even if our government is hypocritical in, in the application. And I, I think it's important to stress that it may not be the system of international justice, which is um, biased or uh, lets the wealthy countries off the hook. The International Criminal Court has launched the investigation um, into the conduct of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, uh, which led to the State Department putting sanctions um, on the ICC officials. Um, so, you know, it's really the U.S. and from Western countries, only the U.S., uh, which refuses to uphold um, international justice for its own soldiers, which refuses the scrutiny of the International Criminal Court. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I think I've given you um, sort of quite a few questions about this, the legality of it. And please, everyone, if you're listening in and you want, if you've got specific questions um, yourselves, please do follow up on that. But now I just want to talk a bit about some, uh, you know, a couple of places, Peter, that you've you've covered. Can you give me an example of where it's been very, very difficult? You've got a, um, you think there've been clear cases of breaches of of um, humanitarian law or the laws of war. But establishing that case has been very, very difficult. I just want to understand the, sort of the difficulties in some situations of use of going about your work. You know, I think uh, one of the most difficult moments for me was um, the genocide against the Rohingya people in Myanmar, Burma, um, just three years ago. Um, actually, three years ago, yesterday, um, the conflict started. Um, and we watched 600,000 people being burned out of their home. Um, in just a couple of weeks, the establishment of the, one of the largest refugee camps in the world um, on mountains of mud. Um, I interviewed woman after woman who had seen their husband shot in front of them, then their children clubbed to death in front of them, then were raped and beaten unconscious and put into burning homes. Um, and we were left with a feeling of complete powerlessness. Um, because nobody really cared about these brown Muslims in Myanmar. Um, very few countries even wanted to speak out, um, and it was devastating. So why, just to, you know, why is that? I mean, you said you used the word brown Muslims. I mean, what did, what was necessary for things to change? Just run through what, what would be necessary for things to change on that front. Well, look, I mean, I, I think there is a, a perceivable bias um, in the international system. Um, the closer we get to Europe, the more concerned people are about human rights violations and violations of the laws of war. I mean, we talked about the village of Lubitin, you know, a massacre of 14 people or whatever it was in Lubitin um, would have barely raised an eyebrow um, in most African countries or Asia. It would not even come into the news media. I mean, I documented massacres like that every day in the Central African Republic in 2014, 2015, um, for months, um, and nobody was paying attention until we forced the French to pay attention through a social media campaign. Um, so it is unfortunately the reality um, that a lot of these decisions are made by Western powers about where we will intervene and where we will not intervene. Um, and they have a much stronger emotional reaction uh, when the victims are people that look like them. Yeah. Um, you've also worked um, with the migration crisis as well in, in um, Greece with, um, well, just actually go back a step, just to clarify what was happening in the Central African Republic, um, who was killing who? So the Central African Republic is one of the poorest countries in Africa. Um, it's located in the center of Africa, as you can imagine by the, its name. Um, it has long suffered from instability and corruption. Um, in 2013, a Muslim rebel group from the extreme north, Muslims are a small minority in the country, overthrew the government with the help of um, the president of Chad. Um, and they started the reign of terror in the country. Um, you know, these are the kind of images you see in African warlord movies about, you know, uh, sunglass wearing guys on pickups just firing into villages and burning them down. Um, and that reign of terror unleashed um, a counter reaction from the local population um, that basically led to the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from the country. Um, you know, a small group of Muslim rebels held the country hostage, but an entire Muslim population, mostly of rural cattle herders, uh, paid the price um, for those atrocities. Yeah. Um, it, it, it sounds terrible when you know, we were talking about um, such appalling events and then sort of glossing over one thing and going on to the next. But it's part of the necessity of, of talking about the breadth of what you were doing. So what were you doing in, I, I know you were in Greece, I know you're on the Greek islands and um, dealing with uh, the, some of the refugees coming across. What was, the, what was your concern there? Well, just one point, like the reason why I'm talking to political tours today and why I've always supported your work um, because it's really important to understand what is happening in these places. Um, you know, at the height of the conflict in the Central African Republic, 
we still had African trophy hunters coming into the country to shoot some rare antelope, completely um, ignorant of what was happening in the country. Um, so I really support the work you're doing. Um, and it is really important to, to have conscious tourism, to, to educate people about what's happening in these countries. Um, the refugee crisis, you know, um, we always talk about the European refugee crisis, but actually the global refugee crisis is not in Europe. Uh, only a very small percentage of displaced people and refugees um, end up in Europe. The real refugee crisis is in countries like Lebanon, where half of the population is either Palestinian or Syrian refugees, um, or Turkey, which is hosting millions of refugees from the Syrian conflict. And finally, um, at the end of the day, um, the, the valve just opened up. Um, the pressure became too great. And with the involvement of criminal groups in Turkey and clearly the support of the Turkish government, uh, because all of these people who got on the boats, uh, they paid about 1,500 um, euros um, for their spot on the boat. Um, we went to one small village in Turkey um, where 200 boats per night um, took off for Greece. Um, you know, they, they, people arrived by the bus load, and you can imagine, you know, you need 200 crates of rubber um, Zodiacs with their motor assembled every night, just give you a scale of the operation. Um, and, you know, Syrians and Afghans, Iranians, uh, Iraqis started to arrive in very great numbers in Europe. Um, it led to a massive crisis because Europe did not have a coordinated policy. Um, everybody started closing their borders. And as always, the, the refugee crisis ended up getting stuck in the poorest countries in Europe because that's where people arrived. Um, as the wealthier Northern European countries turned their backs um, on the refugees and on their Southern neighbors. Um, so we still have a real crisis in Greece, um, in Italy in particular, um, where people are basically trapped. But the real place where people are trapped remains Turkey and Lebanon um, and the other countries where people are fleeing to from a completely untenable situation in Syria. And in Afghanistan, you know, we're all concerned about the Syrians um, who now have seen nine years of conflict. We should remember that Afghanistan has seen decades of conflict um, and just the same kind of brutality uh, that many people face in Syria. Yeah. I'm going to start um, taking questions now. So um, if we could bring um, up Nigel Harley. Um, and th there's a whole, there's a huge, and, and, and hours in a way is too short for the range of things that we can discuss here. But please do start um, putting your questions in the Q&A box um, to both Stacey and Peter. I'm going to, while we're here and waiting for Nigel Harley to, to come up, because as each person asks their question, they have to be joined as an attendee. I want to mention Stacey Sullivan's um, book, which um, is an outstanding book. And I think actually one of the best, um, books written about the conflict in Kosovo. Um, and it's the story of a, a roofer, as it says there, in, in Brooklyn, um, who essentially um, uh, helped arm the KLA. And it, it's not a book that takes sides, but it really gives you a, and it's an amazing story, um, and really, really well worth reading. So that's Stacey's um, previous life when she was a journalist, which led to this book, which is one of my favourites. Okay, Nigel, Nigel Harley. I think Nigel, just there you go. Go ahead. Yes. Go on. Go Can on. you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I really want to know you, uh, hear the views about um, the possibility of prosecuting Assad for war crimes in uh, Syria, because, you know, the sheer scale of this is, is just incredible. And uh, one would absolutely dearly love to see this man hauled in front of the, uh, the, uh, the court in The Hague. So I was just interested in your views on that. Yeah, Stacey, can you just start by talking about, you've done a lot of work on Syria. Um, so what, what has, have you tried to, to raise? Um, what impact do you think you've had? And what are the chances of Assad being prosecuted? You need to unplug your microphone yes, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I should be unmuted now. Um, yeah. To be honest, I'm not sure that I'm really equipped to answer that question. 
Right. I do know that um, there have there has been at least one lo lawsuit um, on behalf of some Syrian refugees who are in Jordan um, that was submitted to the ICC, but I don't know, maybe Peter, you could talk more about the mechanism um, on how it works and whether or not Syria is a party to the ICC and whether or not a prosecution can happen if a state is not a party. Um, because I really, I, I think Peter's probably better equipped to answer that than okay, I am. Okay, yeah, go, go on Peter, go on. Yeah, I mean, so the situation in Syria is that Assad basically has, with Russian help, uh, been able to regain um, control of much of the country, um, a country in ruins. Um, so um, the fact that he probably will likely survive in power makes it very difficult um, to get him detained and ultimately prosecuted. Um, there is a mechanism underway, um, which is an investigative commission by the Human Rights Council, um, which documents the crimes being committed in Syria. Um, it obviously faces a lot of resistance from the Russians. Um, but I think Assad obviously will never travel to Europe again for a vacation. Um, he, he does face very significant restrictions and he is a persona non grata in much of the international world uh, because of the crimes he's committed. Um, I think the most interesting developments are uh, the prosecutions which are taking place across Europe of people who were associated with his regime um, who committed crimes, who uh, tortured prisoners or um, executed people um, and came as refugees um, incognito. They were recognized by their fellow refugees um, and referred for investigation and they're now being prosecuted. Um, you know, I think that is a very important development because it's not only holding the top level people um, accountable. You also want to hold the people below them accountable um, so they think twice before implementing illegal orders because, you know, Assad has everything to lose um, and he's going to, he's willing to do anything to remain in power. Um, but it's his commanders um, who could face prosecution and who, who we want to have thinking about the consequences of their actions. Got it. So do, let's let's bring in more questions now. So please do, um, you know, right away. I can see some people here with some legal minds here um, and quite a few people who've um, uh, s traveled to some of the areas we've been talking about as well. Um, Nigel, does that, does that answer your question, Nigel? Uh, Nigel's microphone is still... Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm slow. Um, yes, yes, I think so. I mean, you know, one just hopes to goodness that uh, eventually this man will get his comeuppance. But yes, very interesting explanation, particularly about the refugees in Europe. Thank you. Peter, what, can you just mention some of the, the recent reports that Human Rights Watch has done on Syria? Um, I actually left Human Rights Watch a few years ago, so Stacey might be better a uh, place to do that. <laughs> and and uh, putting Stacey on the spot here, because Stacey has only recently left the ACLU. <laughs> so... <laughs> exactly. I only recently joined Human Rights Watch, uh, rejoined Human yeah. Rights Watch four months ago. So I... Yeah. That's uh, it, yeah. I mean, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, no. We have investigated, uh, you know, when Human Rights Watch goes in, we investigate abuses by all sides. Um, so we have investigated some of the major attacks on cities and large scale massacres that have been committed by government troops, uh, but also many abuses being committed by rebel groups. Uh, we have spent a lot of time documenting Russia's role in Syria, um, as well as, as um, Iran's role. Uh, because, for example, Iran is forcing a lot of Afghan refugees living in Iran uh, to go fight in Syria um, or send, be sent back to Afghanistan. I met many of these Afghans um, escaping from these practices um, when they were coming as refugees to Europe. And we always say, why are all these young men coming to Europe, young Muslim men? And that's one of the reasons is because Afghans are being recruited by or forced uh, by Iran to go fight um, in Syria. One of the other aspects we worked on a lot um, is the identification of weapons in Syria, um, because there are certain categories of weapons which are banned under international law or severely restricted. 
such as cluster bombs, which is a big bomb that splits into all kinds of grenade-like little bombs and can cause a lot of civilian damage. They don't always explode and kids pick them up. Landmines is another category under an international convention that bans their use. Um, and then also chemical weapons. Um, we were among the first to really establish um, that the Assad government was using chemical weapons um, against the civilian population. And when we issued our first report on the use of sarin gas um, by the Syrian government, I met with the, the French intelligence chief um, in Paris uh, at, the, at the Quai d'Orsay, um, and he congratulated us. He said, your evidence is actually better than ours. Well, uh, th nevertheless, you stand accused of bias. I mean, often by the governments you're investigating. Um, it, I mean, is it, can you just give us some examples of that and how you responded? Peter. Sorry, you cut, it out. You cut out in the middle of the question. It, uh, frequently, there's the accusation of bias. When you're investigating a government, they will accuse you of bias. Um, I mean, the, the, this is something you have to deal with um, uh, quite frequently. Can you just give me some examples? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how uh, little perspective um, any government or any rebel group has on um, the, the nature of our reports. They always only read the sections that relate to them, um, and they don't re read the sections that relate to their adversary. So... I thought at some stage we should just make a list of all of the biases that we've been accused of. Um, you know, we've been accused of being anti-Israeli, anti-Hamas, anti-Palestinian, anti-Hezbollah, an agent of, a Zionist agent, uh, um, an excuser for terrorism, all of these kind of things. Um, but when you actually read our reports, you'll see that we're only after the truth. We don't go after any government in particular. Um, but we hold all of them to the same standard. Yeah, I'm going to put you on the on the spot here, and it's it's perhaps a little unfair. In in 2008, um, I worked for Human Rights Watch in the West Bank and Gaza, and I undertook an investigation about an Israeli operation that led to the deaths of 22 Palestinians, and I documented those in a report that was 70,000 words long, um, too long perhaps. Unfortunately, that report never saw the light of day. Um, it's, it, Israel accuses Human Rights Watch of bias, but equally Human Rights Watch itself is accused of censoring what it does. Is that fair, Peter? No, it was just a crappy report. I've got to get a response from Stacey there too. Go on. <laughs> Stacey, you're moving around, you're bouncing around there. What about that? Apologies, I was... I was interrupted by um, by a couple of children, and and then after I kicked them out, they didn't shut the door, so I had to get up and shut the door. Um, I was going <laughs> to come back to the question that you had asked me a little earlier about the other work that Human Rights Watch has done on Syria, um, and I can say that <laughs> so we have tried to actually do do work on Syria that where we where we feel like we could actually have have an impact. And with a conflict like Syria, it's very, very hard. So the last few reports we've done um, have been around, um, well, one of them was there were, there are a whole bunch of uh, children and, and women who had been married to ISIS fighters and have ended up in camps. And some of them are citizens of European um, or North American countries and their governments won't take them back. So we recently did a report on um, the plight of Canadian kids, Canadian citizens who are stuck in ISIS, who are stuck in camps and Canada won't repatriate them. That was something where we felt like, you know, we are well positioned with um, influential people in Canada. We have a Canada office. We went into the camps, documented who these kids were, what their, what their situation was, how they ended up in these camps, and then pressured the Canadian government to repatriate them and take them back um, with mixed success, but we did get a couple of the kids, a couple of the kids back. Um, we also did um, a report on the plight of 
Syrian refugee children in Jordanian in Jordan who don't have access to education, and we were able to pressure both the Jordanian government and donors who fund refugee assistance in Jordan to provide um, education to allow access to, to allow these kids to to go to school. Um, also, with some mixed success, um, but but and it, sometimes it's very frustrating because. These seem like such small, small issues compared to the larger issue of people being systemic, sy systemically killed mm -hmm. um, in Syria. But sometimes you have to, you have to work on reports where you actually can make a difference. And, and so that's been kind of our strategy. Um, we also recently did a report on sexual violence against men and boys in Syria. Um, and again, with some mixed success of being able to provide some services for refugees in Turkey and Jordan. Um, and it, it's just, you know, we would love to be able to, to do a report that would result in Assad going before the ICC and have an answer to these crimes. Unfortunately, Sometimes we just have to live in this world and be realistic about where we can make a difference and we work on smaller things, but that really can make a concrete difference in, in people's lives. Yeah, okay. Uh, let, let's bring in a few more people. Marcy Ryan, you've got a question. So Marcy, go ahead and, and there you go. Your microphone's free, you can talk. I, I do, thank you. Th uh, I'm in Connecticut and um... Uh, you at Nicholas, you asked my big question about how can the U United States work in this when we're so much uh, guilty of committing these crimes. So, so that leads me to my question about how much credibility do American Human Rights Watch workers have in this work because of the United States position? Peter, are you are you seen as um I mean, uh, Americans? Are you seen as I mean, how how do people view you when you're doing your work? Well, I'm Belgian, um, and I um, try to emphasize that when I do this work uh, because but you're it, also but, a U.S. citizen as well. Yeah, aren't you? yeah, but I carry my Belgian passport um, these days, um, or in the last few years when I was doing this work. Um, I, I mean, I do think there's a very significant impact on how Americans in general are perceived um, and how the whole human rights field um, is perceived uh, with the kind of extreme language coming out of Washington these days. Um, it, it really does undermine not only our cause, um, but also our safety. Um, and I think what we saw happen in Syria, not so much with um, human rights workers, uh, but with journalists, um, who were captured and executed by ISIS. Um, Jim Foley, the last mission he went on before he was captured and ultimately executed um, was with me in Libya. Um, and I'm convinced that, you know, it, it was basically to give a black eye to America. So, you know, we used to have a certain immunity, um, protection, as humanitarian workers, as human rights workers, um, even as journalists. Um, and I think we see those protections being undermined worldwide, and not just because of America. I mean, we have a lot of journalists who are being detained um, or even killed in the Philippines as well, under Duterte. Uh, we have the same situation in Russia. Um, so the kind, you know, the, a press card used to serve um, as a pretty solid protection in most places around the world a few years ago. It just doesn't anymore. So, um, and when you say press card, you're also talking about your ability to go and investigate things as well, having that sense of neutrality there, I guess. Yeah, like a humanitarian jacket uh, with a logo on it. Um, people pretty much left you alone. I mean, I've met with the Taliban in Afghanistan and with rebel groups all over Africa, um, and nobody ever threatened me um, in that way. And I didn't have to worry too much about my safety, even when running into Hezbollah and groups like that, because they knew what we were there to do. Uh, there's many groups today, both militaries um, and rebel groups, uh, where we can no longer assume uh, that sense of safety. 
If they knew you better back then, they'd have taken a different line on you, Peter, I'm sure. Um, Andy, Andy Mendes, um, let's bring, bring in you, please. Yeah, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'm always hesitant to ask these sort of slightly controversial questions, Nicholas, but it's, it keeps you going. I, I was interested in listening to you again about the, the, your comments about Salin and, and the Syrian conflict. And it's all, always puzzled me that if I were a resident in Syria, would I be would I see a real dif difference between being gassed by illegal sarin or blown up by a legal uh, bomb from one of the proxy um, institute or uh, countries that are supporting it? And it, it does seem to me that, that in that example and in all examples that you talk about, we're really governed by international law, owned by and operated on behalf of the powerful nations. I'm just interested in your comments on that. Go on, Peter, go on. That's a very good question, um, and there's much what I agree with in what you said. Um, you know, almost every conflict I went to, um, the journalists were always upset. I think we're not by very exotic weapons. Um, they wanted to bomb and cluster bombs and those kind of things. Uh, but as you said, the reality is that more conventional weapons um, like mortars and artillery um, and aerial bombs. Um, cause a lot of the destruction we see. So we have kind of, Human Rights Watch has a two-pronged strategy on this. The first is to seek to outlaw the most dangerous weapons, weapons which pose a, a significantly increased danger to civilians. For example, cluster bombs, because they have such a failure dud rate uh, that a lot of kids end up picking them up and um, killing themselves. Uh, chemical weapons, just because of their brutal history during World War II, and we've almost succeeded in universally outlawing them. And then with the legal weapons, we look at how they're used. Um, we look at their indiscriminate use. Uh, we've done reports about airstrikes in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, and how they've killed so many civilians. Um, so we certainly don't just give the green light um, just because people are talking about legal weapons. And the word that you use or the word that is used when looking at these cases is proportionality. How much it, was that force justified to target a, a legitimate military target? Um, and what if there was a disproportionate impact on the civilian population around? And you do conventional armies, you know, the IDF, um, the British Army and the US theoretically do look at this each time they're um, targeting somewhere that is meant to be a consideration. Exactly. So let's say that um, Israel managed to locate Nasrallah, uh, the leader of Hezbollah. Um, then they would have to say who is in the same building. Um, are there 20 families living in the same apartment building who may also be killed um, if we hit this building? Um, and is there a way that we can mitigate those casualties? Um, for example, should we wait well, until Nasrallah goes for his daily walk around the block? Um, to hit, hit him with a smaller, more precise weapon um, to decrease the civilian casualties. Um, so those are the kind of calculations that have to take place. And that's also the model of analysis we use to, uh, or Human Rights Watch uses to make judgment calls about these incidents. Okay. Now let's get some more questions in. So please do put um, questions in the, in the, the box there. Um, Stacey, what's, what's been one of the sort of toughest things you've had to work on? You talked about picking up on cases where you can make a difference. And I mentioned um, the report that I wrote, and I think the, uh, the discussion at the time was that it was too big a target and I knew politically it wasn't going to be achievable. And I know that bits of the report were used, were used later. So there is, there is always this internal debate within organizations about what is going to be effective. But can you just give us some examples of where you've, where you've been particularly frustrated? You've talked about Syria, are there other examples? I mean, Israel is always a very difficult one um, because of the um, particular support of, of, of the pro-Israel lobby in the United States. So, um, you know, criticizing, if you criticize Israel, um, you are sure to be a target of a very well organized um, group that defends whatever Israel does. 
And in the example of 2006, when, when Israel had invaded Lebanon and was dropping um, in kind of indiscriminately bombing areas where there were very many civilians, um, Human Rights Watch accused Israel of committing war crimes. And um, that was, I mean, it, there was an outcry, not just by the reflexive Israel defenders that you would expect to hear from, but even from, you know, members of Human Rights Watch's own board. And um, the way that we handled it, Peter was, was on the ground, I think in Lebanon at the time. I was in the New York office where people were absolutely freaking out. Like, you know, how could we accuse Israel of, of committing war crimes? Um, and the organization handled it with this really impressive transparency. They put the researchers on that, they organized a call. Any board members who had concerns or even staff members who had concerns were able to join the call with researchers on the ground in Lebanon and Israel who were able to document exactly what they found and everybody was able to ask questions. Um, and we got to a point where we really felt very solid and certain um, you know, we had this undeniable evidence that what had happened was was a war crime, and we were able to 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 make that allegation credibly um, backed up by evidence. Um, even now, you know, but that so that was one one instance. Nonetheless, anytime we criticize Israel of doing anything, it's a it's a major. You know, it's very very hard, and we have to think about. Um, you don't want to have to think about this stuff, but but you do. You have to think about um, the reputational risk to the organization. You know, donors withdrawing their 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 donations. Um, what we always try to measure what we can actually achieve. So if we make an allegation, but we have no uh, even if, even if we're very confident about it, but we don't feel like there's any practical um, impact that we can make in the world, you know, we might want to think twice about it. And I think that there's a lot of that thinking twice and second guessing um, around making any kind of allegations um, against against Israel. So well, that's a, a particularly perennial frustrating one, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you both experience and that continues that continues today. Um, thank you for that. I mean, wh whilst I'm just looking at the attendees, I know there's some people listening and who, who have um, you know, well qualified or may have good questions. And in the back of my mind, forgive me for mentioning names, but there's some good legal minds. Alan Pardo, for example. I don't know if he's happy to to ask a question or comment. I know Simon Jackson would have something to say, so I'd love to have Simon's name come up if we can, and um, possibly um, Chrissy Feegan's, um, although it is late in Australia. Um, so I'll, be, um, for, I'll um, forgive the Australians for, for not saying anything. Um, so, Peter, can you just follow up on, on, on what Stacey was saying? You know, the, the areas where it's difficult, where it's really, you know, politically sensitive, where an organization, it might be Amnesty, doesn't have to be Human Rights Watch. You know, it, it, some, some areas are very, very difficult to act on, to talk about. You know, I think all human rights work is difficult um, in its own way. Um, it, it's always very challenging to try to get governments um, to acknowledge that bad things have happened and to change their behavior. Um, and it, it is very challenging to get accountability for these crimes. Um, I think it's become a lot more difficult in a world where um, increasingly a number of world leaders are just flaunting um, the norms. You know, you have Duterte in the Philippines killing thousands of um, people involved in drugs or not involved in drugs. Um, I mean, we're talking about very poor people who are occasional drug users being gunned down by the police on a daily basis. Um, you have Putin in Russia apparently poisoning one of his main critics um, just a few days ago. Um, you know, these are very, all of this has created a climate where um, it's much more difficult um, to achieve what we hope to achieve. Um, because 
and obviously the United States, unfortunately, um, is now very much part of this counteroffensive. Um, mm -hmm. And I say, unfortunately, not just for the impact on the human rights movement, but also on the traditional leadership role that the U.S. has built up over decades. Um, you know, the Declaration of Human Rights was signed in San Francisco. Um, I, it, it's like, you know, they built up this very important presence, certainly not a perfect performance, but a very important leadership role in the human rights movement. Um, and then they just walked away from it. And they walked away from the international system that they built up. Yeah. Um, and the consequences are severe, you know? Uh, we only have to look at what happened in Europe in the 1930s uh, with the destabilization of the international system that had been built up, the League of Nations, um, and the economic crisis that um, um, led to the collapse of the German currency, um, and the consequences of war um, and absolute devastation that followed. That's why we built up this international system, uh, to prevent the world from descending into the kind of chaos and bloodshed that we saw in the 1940s. So if we dismantle that system, uh, we are taking a great risk of a return to the kind of conflict we saw during that era. Yeah. Um, Simon Jackson, can I just bring you in? Because I know you've, you've always got um, something to, to raise of interest. So go ahead, Simon, if you can. Okay. I'm, as a, I sort of depressed but not surprised to hear that how difficult it is to raise criticism of Israel. Um, is it the case, albeit ironically, that for a, and it, you know, for an institution that has so much, so much, such deep roots in America, is it that much easier then to criticize American foreign policy than, than Israeli? Um, Peter, I think it's probably fair to ask Peter this because I know that Stacey's in a tricky position uh, as the, the, the current spokeswoman for Human Rights Watch. So, so um, Peter, maybe you can deal with that. You know, I think up to the Trump administration, um, we always had an open door um, in most Washington institutions, whether it was a Republican or a Democratic institution. Uh, things got a little bit rocky during the George W. Bush era, maybe. Uh, but even then, we had very important allies within the State Department. Um, people like Senator John McCain um, helped us gain access because he believed um, in what we were doing in many ways. Um, he often came and visited us out in the field um, and was always ready for a briefing. So, you know, even on both sides of the, of the um, political divide, we had important allies. Um, you know, there's been such a dismantling of the State Department um, that it's become a lot more difficult and it's become a lot more politicized uh, with the current Secretary of State. Um, so there are some doors certainly which are shut right now. Um, but you know, I think it's in every government's interest to listen to us, even if you disagree at the end of the day. Um, they, we bring facts to the table and they may give you an insight on the ground um, that you may not have, because in places like Sri Lanka, uh, we go where their diplomats um, and even their spies don't go. Um, so we do have information that's relative to their, that's important to their decision-making process. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can say a little bit also about, I mean, we, because we don't take any government funding, you know, Human Rights Watch has no problem criticizing the US government and criticizing U.S. foreign policy. Um, the problem comes with, as Peter said, we, under this administration, I mean, we really, we literally have nobody that we can talk to. The Justice Department is completely politicized. The Justice Department was always a place where we could go and talk to people. Now, we can't even go talk to the Justice Department. We, the State Department, there is, uh, the State Department is a little bit better there are some remnants that are, are left that we can speak to, but it too has become very politicized. Um, there are some congressional, you know, we can, we can work with, with Congress a little bit. The administration itself is a completely closed door. So it's become very difficult and very frustrating um, 
in the United States, but it hasn't hindered um, human rights, hasn't hindered us in any way of criticizing US policies um, at all. It's just a question of, of effectiveness in doing it. Mm. So we can be as outspoken as we wanna be, but it's very hard to achieve anything in the US right now. Mm. Thank you, Stacey. Um, Alan Pardo, I can see you there. Alan, can you, can you, you, I think your microphone's open. Go ahead, Alan. Um, simply this, uh, how do you rate the performance so far of the International Criminal Court? And do you have any changes to propose in the way it, in the way it performs, in the way it does its work? So, Peter, you've got direct experience of the, the ICTY. Have you also done work with the International Criminal Court, Peter? Yes, I've assisted them with their investigations um, into the crimes being committed in the Central African Republic um, and also a bit with their investigations into the situation in Darfur. Um, you know, I think we all had great hopes um, for um, the ICC um, that it would serve as an important deterrent, partly because of the great, relatively great achievements of the Rwanda Tribunal and the Yugoslav tribunal in particular um, in bringing some of the biggest criminals of the, the Balkan war um, to trial um, and conviction. I mean, Mladic was just appealing his conviction yesterday for the Srebrenica massacre. Um, but it is an incredible challenge to move from one country, uh, from monitoring the crimes and documenting and prosecuting the crimes in one country, Yugoslavia, to trying to have a global mandate. Um, and I, in my personal um, experience, the ICC has really struggled to uphold um, the high quality level of investigations um, that the Yugoslav Tribunal car carried out. Because you know they've been mandated to investigate um, war crimes and crimes against humanity in many places um, with a relatively small budget, um, yet they've managed to bring very few people to trial, um, let alone convict them. Um, there's been some um, convictions overturned as well um, because of um, faults of the prosecution. So I think we're still very far from an effective ICC and the danger now is that um, with African governments and the US opposing the ICC, the, it, it will be significantly weakened um, and um, face great obstacles in achieving uh, what it was set out to achieve. Well, I'm afraid, chaps, that's um, our, our um, hour is up. My thanks again to Stacey Sullivan and to Peter Bukart. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.